Well, this morning we are returning to our sermon series in 1 Corinthians, and uh, we want to take up 1 Corinthians 14, 1 Corinthians 14, um, as it relates to us the the whole issue of of worship. We're going to be looking at the the issue of worship, and and I say it that way, and it kind of even sounds wrong to my ears, the issue of worship. We're looking at the issue of worship in worship. So, so that, that's a bit of a challenge for us, I suppose, and yet we're doing that because that's the nature of the text. Oftentimes when we talk about worship, we talk about worship as the subject of worship. Um, this is who it is that we worship. We worship the Lord Jesus Christ. We, we talk about the object of our worship. Or we talk about the motivation for our worship. Why do we worship? We worship because of the grace that God has shown us. We worship because of the mercy that we've received. But Paul in 1 Corinthians 14 is inviting us to focus on the subject of worship. The issue as I said a moment ago, the, the issue of worship, the, 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 the matter of what we are doing when we gather here. And of course, worship for us is central to, to who we are. It's our, it's, our, it's our bread and butter, not just because we're believers, but because we are the creation of God. And the nature of our creation is we're always looking for something or someone to to put into place our trust in. That's why even here at Buffalo Church, we we have a whole vision that is built around the idea of worship. Because we recognize we're all worshiping something, someone, but not necessarily the one who is worthy of of worship, worthy of all of our trust, all of our life. And that's where, again, normally the focus gets to be on the object or the motivation. But this morning we have the subject. Now, we haven't read the text yet, but as you come to the text, on on one hand, 1 Corinthians 14, beginning at verse 26, this is really easy. This is not a difficult passage. Pretty simple stuff. As, as a matter of fact, um, it, it's almost preschool level lesson. I'm not joking. We'll get to that later, right? But, but you come to this text, and it's almost preschool level lesson. It's, it's that easy. And yet, on the other hand, th- this passage presents a number of complications, Not least of all, because as we're going to read at verse uh, 33, as in all the churches of the saints, the women should keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission as uh, to the law, as the law says, it's shameful for a woman to speak in church. And and that's not going to be a challenge for us to look at just in light of living in the 21st century, but this is going to be a challenge for us to look at just in light of the overall study of 1 Corinthians. And we're actually not going to be able to even really dig into that this morning, that that verse. But but this this passage has its complications, and yet it's also very easy. But the complication isn't even just connected to the fact that, oh man, what, what do we... What do we do with kind of the egalitarian mindset with which we find ourselves in the 21st century and what Paul says, beginning at verse 33? The challenge for us with this passage is also because their worship service looked a lot different than than what we experience as a worship service here. Things were different here than how we experience it here. And it's not necessarily, well, that was wrong there and we're right here. It was just, no, there were, there were different things going on. We don't exactly totally understand everything here that was going on that Paul is, is referring to. That's part of the complication of getting to understand this text. 
And that's why we need to look at the principles of this passage in terms of what God is teaching us about how it is that we're called to worship. Okay, so with all of that, let's get the text in front of us. So, beginning at verse 26, 1 Corinthians 14, we read these words. What then, brothers? When you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. If any speak a tongue, let there be only two or at most three, and each in turn, and let someone interpret. But if there's no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in church and speak to himself and to God. Let two or three prophets speak, and let the others weigh what is said. If a revelation is made to another sitting there, let the first be silent. For you can all prophesy one by one, so that all may learn and all be encouraged. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to prophets, for God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. As in all the churches of the saints, the women should keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission, as the law also says. If there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Or was it from you that the word of God came? Or are you the only ones it has reached? If anyone thinks that he is a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge that the things I am writing to you are a command of the Lord. If anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. So my brothers, earnestly desire to prophecy and do not forbid speaking in tongues, but all things should be done decently and in order. Thus far from the reading of God's holy and inspired words. So I want to look at, at two points um, from this passage. And, and again, like I said, we're going to have to revisit this passage because I want to dig into that, that section probably that piques most people's interests as it relates to the, the role and the function of men and women, women, men within the life of the church. We're going to have to save that for um, a, a, another time. But, but I want to look at, at two points with you um, as it relates to this passage. And, and the first is orderly speech. So Paul is calling for the church to be in a place of order, and so the first thing that he says is that there needs to be orderly speech. And the second thing that he says that, that there needs to be by way of principle is that there needs to be purposeful listening. Orderly speech and purposeful listening. And, and these points are not, in a sense, ironclad, isolated from one another, right? They, they kind of play off of each other. You, you need to have orderly speech so you can have purposeful listening. You can't have purposeful listening unless you have orderly speech. So, right, these kind of points come together, and that's where Paul addresses the church, because it was exactly that which was not happening in the worship that was taking place in Corinth. So look at what we read. What then, brothers, when you come together, each one has a hymn and a revelation and a lesson and a tongue and an interpretation, and, and everyone comes to church, and, and they all want to kind of show what they have. Like, like, this is what I got, and this is what I got, and this is what I have, and this is what I have. And it ends up being like, here we go, like preschool. And everyone is so happy, they're so excited, and they all want to just talk, and they start just talking over top of each other. And so believe it or not, as we come to 1 Corinthians 14, we're not talking about preschool age children, no offense, preschool age children, but we're talking about adults, but they're kind of acting like preschool age children when they're just talking over top of each other. And so one of the first lessons that you need to have when you come to preschool is you can't just 
blurt out the answer. You just can't kind of scream out whatever it is that you think that you need to scream out. What, what do preschool teachers have to tell their kids? Sometimes even above preschool age, we got some teachers here. Um, you gotta put up your hand. If you wanna talk, you gotta put up your hand, okay? I don't see any hands, shouldn't hear any mouth. We see your hand, and then I'll call on you, then you can talk, floor is yours. It's simple lessons, easy stuff. And yet when we come to 1 Corinthians 14, we see that as the church gathered together, there was not orderly speech. It was driven by self and not selflessness. Everyone was asserting themselves. Everyone had their truth. Everyone had their perspective. Everyone had their opinion. And it's all being poured into the mix. Notice how Paul begins verse 26. He begins with a question. What then, brothers? What's going on, brothers? What, what should I say to all of this? And, and that's interesting to, to notice that Paul begins with a question. Because if, if you've been tracking with us, because we've been in First Corinthians for a long time, and I don't even know that I should expect you to know this, but, but maybe you remember this. A, a lot of First Corinthians, Paul is actually answering questions that the Corinthians had asked him. Beginning in chapter 11, he is dealing with the whole issue of worship and questions that had arisen about worship. And now we come to verse 26, chapter 14, and now Paul says, you know what? I have a question. I have a question for you. And in effect, what Paul is asking is, does this glorify God? Is God honored by this? Is God, is God pleased by our worship? That's a, that's a good question for us to ask, isn't it? Good question for us to ask. Is God pleased with our worship? Is he, is he honored by it? Kind of begs another question, though, doesn't it? Because how do you know if God is pleased with your worship? How do we know God is honored by worship of Bethel Church? He, he is honored by this. He is blessed by this. He is praised by this. You go, I don't know, because I'm offering it, I guess. So if I, if I offer it, he's going to be pleased with it. Well, is that how it works in your home? Your kids, anything your kids do, you're pleased with it. They're like, who made the mess? I did. Are you pleased? No. <laughs> no. So you have to go further than, well, of course God's pleased with it because it's lovable old us offering it. You have to go further than that. And that's where we come into the principle of the passage. Look at what verse 40 says. But all things should be done decently and in order. If I've heard that once, I've probably heard it close to a thousand times at different meetings that I've been to over the years, at classes or synod. Well, you know, brothers, we, we need to do things decently and in good order. Hey guys, don't forget, we're called to do things decently and in good order. Well, notice that it's not simply talking about how we function in church meetings, but it's talking about church worship. So, how do we know if our worship is honoring and glorifying to God? We don't just shrug our shoulders and go, I don't know. No, you go to the principle, verse 40, is it done decently and in good order? Like, I think so. 
but why does it need to be done decently in good order? Again, we're just kind of keep pushing, pushing it with questions. It's like, okay, great, decent, order, good, but why? Why does it need to be done decently in good order? Back to bus up, verse 33. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. How do we know that our worship of God is honoring to God? It needs to be reflective of God and how he made us. You see what Paul is doing there? You see, the reason why it needs to be done decently and in order is because our God, verse 33, is not a God of confusion, but of peace. And here you need to back up the bus even further because notice he's not a God of confusion or peace in the context of how we interact with each other as fellow believers. And that backs the bus all the way back to verse 26. What then, brothers? This is honoring to God. This is glorifying to God. You come together. Everyone has a hymn and a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, an interpretation. Everyone's talking over top of each other. Let all things be done for building up. There it is. He builds working in reverse. Verse 40, decently good order because it's a reflection of the God who is not a, one of confusion, but of peace, which means that our assembly, our worship, can't be of confusion, but it needs to be for peacemaking and building up in the church. Let all things be done to build up. So why do we worship? We worship because of God's amazing love, his amazing grace. We're going to focus on that tonight, Lord's Day 23, that we're justified by faith alone, through Christ alone, grace alone. That's the motivation, object, of course, Jesus. But how do we got to make sure that this is operating in a way that honors him? That we're asking these questions. Is this building us up in our faith. Is, is, this, is this taking us, because the idea of building up assumes that, that we are by nature broken down. Is this building us up and confirming us in the hope that we have? And again, Paul's point here is very simple. You got people talking over top of each other. No one understands what's going on. You have three people speaking. Well, we can't have three people speaking. Just, just one at a time. Put your hand up. You'll be recognized. We have people that are speaking in tongues. Then there's no interpretation. How is, that, how is that benefiting anyone? No one understands what's going on. No one can even hear through the, the madness of it all. How are we, the church, being built up if there's not orderly speech? It's interesting, right? What does Paul say? Verse 27. If any speak in a tongue, let there be only two, or at most, three. And then verse 29, he says, let two or three prophets speak, and let the others weigh what's said. At the most, three. Have two, don't have any more than three. Why? Again, this is not hard, is it? Because, like, my time's almost up here, right? Like, I'm looking at a big clock back there, and I'm going, Jason, you're spending a lot of time on this first point. You had to get the second point. But maybe you're thinking that too. And then I go, oh, and by the way, Pastor Cal, you're going to come up, and you're going to speak for 40 minutes. You ready? I don't know. He's like, no, I'm not ready. But but we're going to have him come. Well, he's going to speak for 40 minutes. And we have someone else from another ministry. They're going to come up. They're going to speak for 40 minutes. And you're going, how long are we going to be here today? Oh, and we have three people that are going to speak in tongues, but it's going to be interpreted, so we got, we got that as well. Like, no, that's, that's not going to be building us up. That's going to be a burden to us. We're, we're, that's, that's too much. We need to be built up. 
And so Paul says there needs to be clear speech. Why clear speech? Because only when there's clear speech can there be purposeful listening. So let's get to that second point. The burden in all of the, there needs to be one at a time. Don't overburden this. Don't don't have this false sense of guilt. Like, this is all good, right? This is all edifying. This, This is rich. And so we should just go on and on. No, no, no. There needs to be purposeful listening. Look at what we read, verse 31. For you can all prophesy one by one so that all may what? Learn, and all may be encouraged. What's the point of trying to make sure that what we do in worship has a simplicity to it in the way that we speak, the words that we use, the songs that we sing, the translation of the Bible that we utilize? It's so that we can be purposeful listeners, that we can listen. Why do we have to listen? So we can learn and be encouraged. For our learning and our encouragement. Not many of us are called to ministry where we have to speak in that ministry, officially and publicly. But when we gather for worship, while many of us may not be called to that aspect of ministry for worship, we are all called as prophets, priests, and kings to be actively, purposefully listening so that we can learn. One of our songs of the month is, I want to know you, Jesus. I want to learn more about you, Jesus. And that takes place when we listen. When we're actively engaged in listening so that we can learn. Interesting, the word learn here is is linked to the idea of discipleship. So last week we were Matthew 28, Easter, resurrection of Christ. Matthew 28, we don't oftentimes think of it in the context of, of, of Easter as much as we think of it in the context of Great Commission Therefore, in the name of the risen Christ, go to the nations and do what? Make disciples. How do you make disciples? You have to listen. This listening process, this is the equipping that takes place when the shepherd speaks and the sheep hear his voice. When, when the shepherd speaks and says, follow me, we hear his voice, and we, we follow. But we can't follow if we're not listening. And a lot of times, the not listening for us, it's not because we have 15 people talking at the same time. That's probably not our, our challenge. That's not the makeup of our worship services. It's, it's not what's happening here but we have a dialogue inside of our minds that can bring us all different sorts of directions. We bring our troubles and we bring our weak and we bring our whatever and and our mind is not engaged and we need to intentionally and purposely say, the shepherd is among us. The shepherd has ordained this service. The shepherd has ordained this man to speak this word so I hear his voice. And, and maybe this doesn't touch an exact issue in my life right now, but that doesn't give me permission to drift off in my mind and, and who knows where I am now. No, I'm, I'm going to purposefully listen so I learn because I'm a disciple of Jesus. And it's only when you listen to learn that what happens? Encouragement. Why is Paul so intent that that we make sure that we have orderly speech so that we have purposeful listening? Why do we need to have purposeful listening? So we learn. Okay, great. We're just here to learn so that in learning, we'd be encouraged. 
Let me just say, there are three aspects to this encouragement. There is a kind of press encouragement. A kind of press encouragement. What do I mean by that? So Riverbank Run is going to be coming up, right? And you have people that are going to be on the sides of the roads, and, and the runners are going to be going by. And, and when you go to a race, if you've ever been to a race before, 5K, what, whatever it is that you're at, right? People don't just like watch and go, well, that person has an interesting stride, and oh, look at those person's sneakers or whatever, right? Like, no, you're on the side of the road, and you're like, keep going. Keep going. Keep running. It's almost over. You've got this. Pressing encouragement. Encouragement that presses you forward. The book of Revelation. To him who overcomes. To him who endures. Keep running. And we come and, and we offer up worship to God. And the God of heaven and earth, he speaks to us intimately and he presses that encouragement. Keep running. Keep striving. I am with you. I've not forsaken you. I've not abandoned you. Keep running. I will not ask you to do something and not simultaneously give you the strength to do it. I'm not going to go, there you go, and I'm just going to back off. No, keep running. When you listen and you learn and you're being discipled by Jesus, he gives us that pressing encouragement in our weariness. Second kind of encouragement, pastoral encouragement. We get pastoral encouragement. Encouragement, not just when we're weary, but when we are, if you will, wounded. Encouragement that comes and reminds us that our God does not break the bruised reed. And he does not quench the smoldering wick. And we come and we are wounded. And people are singing happy songs and we're looking around and going, I, I, am, I am not there. I am not there. Come in a worship service and people are smiling. How are you doing? Great. How's vacation? Awesome. And my life is not great and it's not awesome. And it could be a burden to hear that. Not that it's wrong. It's where I am. And we gather for worship and we make sure that it is orderly and reflective of our God to build others up because there are those that need to hear that pastoral word spoken into their wounds. That God is not going to crush us. He's not going to give us something that we cannot bear. He will give us strength sufficient for the day. Tomorrow, he says, that's not your problem. Today, I have you. Tomorrow, I'm going to have you too, but don't push the boat off. Live day by day. Right? We need that pastoral encouragement. That's why we come and engage in this strange thing called worship. We come and for 30, 40 minutes, listen to what the world would see as just a guy speaking, like doing his little TED Talk thing. And we come to hear the voice of our shepherd pastor us as he disciples us. And then just the last kind of encouragement, because this is encouragement too, and that is the pointed encouragement. Speaking of the book of Revelation, when Jesus writes to the seven churches, he gives them pastoral encouragement, he gives them pressing encouragement, but he also gives them pointed encouragement, doesn't he? But this I have against you. And we want our ears to be open, and our hearts to be engaged, so we can also hear those pointed comments 
that are challenging us and our walk with Jesus because maybe we're starting to just drift. Um, just totally random, just came into my mind actually. I was, I was watching, um, this is, don't think I'm too weird. I'm, don't think I'm weirder than you already think that I am, but I was watching a YouTube video on um, air traffic control um, yesterday and there was a Southwest flight that was coming into LaGuardia and he thought that he was on course. He was flying the LS, um, uh, uh, ILS uh, runway system. He was coming into runway four and, and everything looked good and, and he thought that he was spot on. He was nearly 1,500 feet to the right of the runway. He got to a point where he was 150 feet off the ground. And all of a sudden, wave off, wave off, abort, abort, climb, get to 2,000 feet, almost hit the tower in LaGuardia. I don't know if this hit the news or not, but there it was, and they're going through the report. He thought that he was online. Everything about him said, I mean, bad weather and low visibility, and is that minimums? And, but, okay, we're going we're gonna to put this thing down right where it's supposed to be. And all of a sudden, abort, abort. What are you thinking? What are you doing? You're 1,500 feet away from the runway. And sometimes we need to come to church as we worship our God who is so good. And he needs to say to our lives, abort, wave off. What are you thinking? You are so far off the center line that leads to life. And we need that conviction. And Jesus speaks that encouragement because he loves us. And that's why we do this. That's why we spend time studying this. Worship it needs to be ordered, needs to be structured, because we need to have the order and structure and holiness in our lives. So there are some things here we still need to deal with, and, and I want to deal with those with you. Um, next week, God willing, probably not in the morning because we're going to have a baptism, and I don't know if we want to have the whole issue of whether or not women should speak in church um, <laughs> for baptism. So we'll probably push that one into the evening, um, but we still have some more things I want to I look at with you in this passage um, as God speaks to us about this worship. But until then, let's continue to offer up to him our worship and prayer.